Turn back, if you will, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 22 and 23, just a couple of verses there that we're going to be looking at today. Uh, we were sitting there just kind of singing some of those songs. Uh, uh, we knew the words of that, and many of you did, because I looked over and saw you singing. Uh, but uh, in the bicentennial year, way back when, um, 75 and 76, uh, in between that year, there were six of us that uh, wore red, white, and blue and went to churches and civic groups and all that. Melody and I were there. Every once in a while, one of those pictures pops up on Facebook, and you're like, can I block this some way or another? It's a tall, skinny guy there. Anyway, and we sang some of those songs. So a lot of that just was coming back to us, you know, because we do have so much that uh, we need to be thankful for to live in this country. And as we travel around this uh, world of ours on mission trips and other places, what we really don't know, let me say this, if you've never left this country, then you don't know how to appreciate it because you don't know what to compare it to. And there are sights and sounds and smells and activities that makes you glad to get back and you feel like kissing the ground when you get back to the United States. Well, I want us to look at just a couple of uh, verses of Scripture this morning, and then we're going to be speaking from that at this time. Uh, Proverbs chapter 22. If you'll stand, please, as we read verses uh, we're going to read verses, uh, I'm not sure what we have there, if we have 28 and 29, and if we have uh, just 28, and I'm going to read 28 and 29, and then over in Proverbs 23, 10 and 11, and just read those. Uh, there in Proverbs chapter 22, do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings, and he will not stand before unknown men. And then over in chapter 23, again, the word is said here in verse 10 and 11, Do not remove the ancient landmark, nor enter the fields of the fatherless, for their Redeemer is mighty, and he will plead their cause against you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how our hearts have been blessed this morning as we think about how you have shed your grace upon these United States of America and its forming and how it has been standing through these years because of its strong Christian foundation. And Lord, help us never forget that, that we're not strong because of ourselves. We're strong because of you. And Lord, today I pray that there is a call to fall and a call back to our responsibility and recognition of you and responsibility to share this gospel and to, and to speak to people everywhere about the great privilege that it is to be a part of, of this nation, but most of all, to be ambassadors of the King. So Lord, would you bless in these moments that we share your word, and I pray that you'll just bless us indeed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's not been a hotter topic, we'll say, in the last month or so than that of immigration here in America. And as we think about that today, the millions of, of, of undocumented um, that have come into this country or are trying to get in by any means possible has certainly stressed and strained uh, what our immigration laws are all about. And uh, really it's not a matter so much of people coming in because, by the way, all of us are immigrants except for our Native Americans. Every one of us are immigrants. And our people came in and there is a way to come and there's a way not to come. Uh, I can't it, it boggles my mind to see 70% of the children who come to the border being pushed across the border without their parents, and, uh, which has been a part of this problem that we have. And it's not an easy problem. It's that problem that has been kicked down the road from one administration to the next administration to the next, and our legislators are just going to have to get their act together and see how we can, in a lawful way, uh, bring in even others who want to be a part of this, many because they would like to get into this nation because they know it's the greatest nation on the face of this earth, and how you bring them in, some of which are facing death and drug cartels and everything that's on the other side of the border, and how you bring them in in the orderly way that it does not absolutely sink your school systems that have limited resources and teachers to be able to take care of them, limited amounts of, of those that uh, have when hospitals that will be overrun with those that are coming in. How is there an orderly way to do that? And again, the whole 
answer to this is not simple. It's very complex. And so I'm hoping that they'll get together on both sides of the aisle and look at this and see what can be done that even these may become, some of which would become law-abiding citizens, not coming in to do harm to our country, but would be a help to our country and nation in that particular way. And how do we handle all this? It is, uh, it's very complicated. We think about that. Uh, we think about is that, uh, that this problem will be fixed. But let's keep in mind this fact, that as we're all immigrants, let's be reminded that even the Lord Jesus and uh, his parents were refugees as they fled into another nation. Uh, Egypt as they had to go down to uh, even have their life spared. So uh, we should never be heartless. We should never be merciless. We should never be without compassion and, uh, and try to do things in decency and in order in a way that will be a help and be a blessing to many of these and most of all an opportunity to, uh, to even be able to share the gospel with them. So when we think about that, we come to a day and time of which we think of immigration. When you see a, a title like today, America Restore the Borders, uh, let me say that the message is not about immigration. Uh, the message is about restoring the ancient landmarks. That's the passage of Scripture that we've used here in chapters 22 and 23. And so we began to look at it historically. What are historical landmarks? And what was he saying here about do not move the ancient landmarks and, and keep them here. Let's restore them, keep them in their right place of where they are. Well, simply said, the landmarks were those, if it were stacks of rocks, if it were some type of, of stake that was put in the ground. It was some kind of landmark that said, this is the four corners of this vineyard, of this field, of this garden, of this, uh, tre uh, this uh, uh, trellis or, or terrace area that's been put up. They're the borders that, that hold it into place. And so don't remove those. Why is it so important not to remove those? Because the borders were that which meant a person's livelihood a family's livelihood. It was a very agricultural society, and so their land borders, even as we have uh, wheels, to, or not necessarily wheels, but we have deeds today that speak to land borders today, they're very important. If someone just decides, well, you know, I'm going to go in the middle of the night, I'm going to move this over about five feet, and then I'm going to go another month and move it over another five feet, then you begin to close in on the borders and someone's being cheated. And that's why it says in chapter 23 and verse 11, let's keep in mind that God is the person who will, will try to help those who are the helpless and the hopeless and that he is going to be the redeemer who will stand for them and what, what is right and what is wrong. Now, in that day and time, it was such a, a great uh, a problem in that some people would try to move these or try to claim land that was not theirs that even the law of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 14 speaks against it. And in some cases, a person would be tried and even to death. Other civilizations like the Romans held this as also a sacred trust in that a landmark, a border of a property could not be moved because uh, in many cases it would mean death if a person was caught moving those types of landmarks here. So it was really sacred, punishable by death in many ways. These are the historical landmarks. And so when the law is given here and this is the borders that are set up, that's what it's really talking about here. But let's move on a little bit further when it's talking about ancient landmarks because let's talk about not only historical landmarks, but let's speak about some spiritual landmarks that God has given to us when we think about not removing our landmarks here. Now, landmarks in Scripture, uh, it could be the pillars of stone. You remember the story of Laban and how he had two daughters and Jacob had to work seven years and he had to work another seven years. If you remember your Old Testament uh, uh, scripture there. And you remember as he was working for, uh, for, uh, for Leah and, and Rachel, and he was trying to, to, to get the right one. It was a switcheroo type of thing, and so he had to work another seven years. Finally, there was an agreement made by Jacob and Laman, uh, Laban that uh, they would put a stone of rock, let this pillar be, stand as, as a reference to the fact that we have made a covenant that will stand today. That's what it was all about. You remember in Joshua chapter 
chapter 4, when the children of Israel had been through the wilderness experience and they come to uh, the, the, Red, uh, the, excuse me, the, the Jordan River, they're about to go through into the promised land. And this is a time that the waters of the Jordan did not, um, did not split. But instead, the Bible says that they stood up in a heap and you can just picture that upstream. And it was in the flood season nonetheless, and so there was a lot of water. But the flood water stood up in a heap upstream near the city of Adam. And the Bible says that they were able to go through on dry land. And they took 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And they said, let this stand as a pillar, as a monument, as a memorial. Let this be an ancient landmark of what God did, that not only did we cross the river in flood, stage, but we did so as the water didn't come near us and we walked across on dry ground. Just as much a miracle as it was for the Red Sea. So those are some spiritual landmarks that we certainly could talk about today. We talk about other spiritual landmarks and we talk about people in the Bible. Adam and Eve being the first people and of course the, uh, the, the covenant that God made with Adam of what he was going to do and what he was supposed to do. We think of people like Noah and the covenant that was made with him and even a covenant of the rainbow that he would not cause it to flood the earth again and destroy all the population because of a worldwide flood like that was. We think of uh, of, of Abraham and the covenant that God had with him and because he was willing to sacrifice his only son on Mount Moriah that God said this will be it and your faith that you were willing to do this to the point that you had him tied up laid on the altar and the knife was back and you were ready to take his life shows me that you were willing to do this and he says your faith is accounted as righteousness it was an Old Testament type of faith because God always knows the heart of what a person is, what's being transacted. Or maybe it was Moses. Everybody goes to Moses. You look to our Supreme Court today, and what you'll see on the outside of the Supreme Court is Moses and the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and so he's always been looked to and hearkened to as a spiritual uh, type of landmark when we look at what Scripture has to say. We look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest spiritual landmark who has ever come. No one has changed the world more than our Savior, the Lord Jesus. One who literally split time from, from uh, B.C. to A.D. One who has changed the whole climate of what it's all about. The reason we're here today and have life and we have spiritual life is because of Him. We look at the cross as, a, as that great cross. We'll glory in the cross because it's in the cross of Christ that our salvation was bought. Our spiritual heritage and landmark of the empty tomb. As we go over and go over, look to go over again next fall as with a group of people, we'll go to the empty tomb tomb that's still empty today. We rejoice in that particular type of landmark that God has given to us. So there's spiritual landmarks all throughout history. We talked about last week about there being an unstoppable gospel. And because of these spiritual landmarks, and especially Jesus, the cross, and the empty tomb, we have a reason to take forth an unstoppable gospel in our, uh, in our land today. Now, we understand this. That at the same time it's an unstoppable gospel, we know that there are countries where it is illegal to take the Bible in. Some countries have banned it. The communists have burnt it. There are a vast number of people, even here in America today, who simply ignore it. And yet it's the, the greatest book that's ever been written, and it's still an all-time bestseller today. Why? Because, as we said in that pledge, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, as the psalmist has said. But sad to say, America today has strayed from what it used to be. There's not a person in here today, unless you happen to be of preschool age, who would say this country is still the same today. Many of you remember a day when you say, boy, I remember back when. And, and you may say, well, these were the good old days, and part of it was, the truth of it, part of it was good and part of it wasn't. The outside toilets were not good. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the fact of no air conditioning was not necessarily good. You, you look at that when you, when you didn't have good transportation, uh, that was not a good thing. But anyway, the things have changed, and how much they've changed just over the decades that we've seen. And what has taken place here in America is that we have strayed 
from the ancient landmarks of which this country was founded and specifically founded to be a Christian nation. Founded to be a land based upon that, and, and, and that is the base thing that we have to look at today. So if we're going to get back to a fact again of restoring these spiritual borders of what it used to be as the nation was originally founded, whether it was Christopher Columbus as he came over here, not simply trying to sail out somewhere and just find a new land, but literally he sailed out for a purpose in mind. Uh, and, uh, and, and I could just read you what he had to say about that. He says... Um, when he was talking to, uh, to the king there, he said, you know, no one should be afraid to take on any enterprise in the name of our Savior. It, if it is right and if the purpose is purely for his holy service, and I say that the sign which convinces me is the preaching of the gospel recently in so many lands. This is Christopher Columbus. Now, let me say this. We live in a nation who the, those that are on the liberal side would never want you to hear the truth of what history is all about. So when you don't want to hear what history is all about, you simply delete it. You simply remove it. You simply don't re record it. And so what it becomes is forgotten history. And let's just tell you the parts that we want to make sure that you understand so you only understand the parts that we want you to see. So you'll never see those things in history books. Those of you who have come up through the years are things that were in your history book that will never be recorded because much of that was about this being founded as a Christian nation and founded for that specific purpose. We've been told that this nation was founded by a bunch of people who didn't want to have any type of certain religion and all the things that are found in there. That could not be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, they were very express in their sentiments of what they had to say, and even the charters of our states talk about it being because of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's still there today for people to see. It's just that you never see those types of words because of how uh, this nation was founded, like the Charter of Massachusetts. Let's throw out one of those particular states. And our people said may uh, be, and this is in old English, may be so religiously and peaceably and civilly governed as their good life and orderly conversation um, may win and incite the natives of that country, talking about the original Indians, to the knowledge and obedience of the only true God and Savior of mankind in the Christian faith, which is our royal intention. And so this is in the original charters of Massachusetts in 1629. There is no mistake from 1492 in Columbus to 1629 and the other charters of all the states that this was founded for th this country was founded for this particular purpose in mind, spiritual landmarks. And so when we begin to think about that, we think about well, what has taken place and why are we in the situation that we're in today? Why is it that we find ourselves here? Because again, we've been told something that is not true. Do you realize that 69% of the people out there being polled realize or believe that the words separation of church and state are included in our original documents? Now, you know because you've heard me say before, there were no original documents, simply a letter from President Thomas Jefferson from, to the, in response to the Danbury Baptist who had heard that there was, there was, they were going to make a certain denomination. This, what is in, it wasn't even about faith. It was of one particular Christian faith, and the Baptist said, you're not going to make this a congregational type of, of state religion that we're going to have. And they were concerned. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote back, he wrote back those great words that there should be a separation of church and state. In other words, no certain state-sponsored religion as they have it in England. That's what he was responding to, never in original documents. It was simply a letter that was sent to the Danbury Baptist. Now, that's the truth. You just won't hear that. So why is everyone, when every time you start to say something, oh, you can't do that, there's separation of church and state? No, there's not. There never has been. 
And we've been so gullible. It's been said, if you tell something long enough and strong enough and loud enough, people will just believe it. And, and listen, what we have tolerated for one generation, the next generation embraces. Said over and over again. And you can see it, and I can see it. So what are some of these spiritual landmarks in these cases? What are some of these, these types of borders that need to be reestablished and because they're ancient landmarks that we've kind of walked away from historically? And again, I, I could give you more information than you would ever want to know because I could read out all these kinds of things. And when you got those papers out, you probably said, I hope he is not going to read all of that. So I'm going to spare you that, but simply to say it's out there. And by the way, that's why Washington, D.C. has got Scripture carved all over the walls of the buildings and even our Supreme Court because that's what this country was founded upon and will always be. We have just ventured away from that. And listen, you can point to this generation and say what's wrong with it if you want to. But it's what the former generations have tolerated that has caused this today. If there are no foundations, then a nation will crumble. If we cease to hold on to that, which is valuable and which is our very lifeblood, and we think, well, I don't want to cause any waves, and, you know, I just, I just want to be peaceful. Can't we just all get along? And so, you know, I, you know if, if you say it didn't say that, and I don't see that it's there in your book that you just wrote, so I'm just going to kind of move back over here. And listen, we moved the border so far this way that we've forgotten who we're supposed to be. We are God's people that are called to make a difference, light and salt in a dark world. And it's time, America, that we restore the borders, the borders of being a Christian nation that we ought to be. So when we think of this, we think about some of those particular things that have taken place. Like, uh, what about the sanctity of Scriptures? Now, again, many just want to ignore the Bible today, saying it's just another book. Uh, Les and our Gideons have been kind of kicked out to the sidewalks and uh, kicked out from everything they can be kicked out as Gideons because they like to share the Word of God. And some hotels have said, uh, uh, we just can't even carry that there because we may be offending certain people. Uh, let me be a little bit more offensive to you, then I don't have to stay here, okay? That's just where we can stand on that issue. But most of them still have the Word of God there. But to many, it's just a book that it has no authority. Whenever it has no authority, then we have no authority in life. It's just a mere suggestion that we ought to try the best that we possibly can to treat other people as we would like to be treated. No, Jesus said that in the form of a command and a law that we're supposed to uphold. And so it is the sanctity of scriptures, the sole authority. When there is no authority, everybody does what they think is right in their own eyes. That's what happened in the time of Judges, and mankind is no different today than it was in the time of Judges. So let's just set any parameters you want to. And by the way, because we live in a day of relativism, what's true to you may not be true to me. What's true to you, it, is, it doesn't necessarily have to be true to me. Well, if I walk out in front of this car, and this car's coming down the road at 45 miles an hour, and I step in front of it, it's not going to be good. Well, that might be true for you, but it's not necessarily true for me. Let's try it. You go first. That's what, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to end up the same way. But listen, that's what they're saying. That might be true for you. That might work for you. You may believe that, but I don't necessarily believe it. You may believe in hell. I don't. If there's anything that's just heaven, and let's just all go there, and don't you know everybody goes to heaven? No, that's not what the authority of the Word of God says. It says the majority are going to miss heaven and go down the broad way to the place called hell. And that's the words of Jesus himself when he said that to us. The sanctity of scriptures and those who would scoff at the word of God that has rung true over and over and over again and always will be true because the word of God endures forever. His word is everlasting. There's the sanctity of life. Let's talk about that a little bit especially as we look at that, because that seems to be a hot topic that's on, the, uh, is on the, the, the radar, at least right now, with another possible Supreme Court uh, pick, and undoubtedly that's going to take place. We live in a society 
that back in 1973, the Supreme Court said, well, it's a, in Roe versus Wade, it's a woman's right to choose. She still has the right to choose. And, and by the way, that choice may be called pro-choice, but it's really pro-death. There's pro-life, and then there's pro-death. And this is not a blob. This is not just a fetal matter. This is not something that is... The Bible's very clear that it's at the moment of conception that life begins. And we do not have the responsibility to take a living life. And most of it's from convenience. They say, well, there's always these cases... 2%. Let's not talk about the, the givens on this, this, and this. Let's talk about, for most people, it's the convenience issue because they don't want to live with the results of their behavior. And people are snuffing out how many? Well, let's go since 1973. 60 million babies. 60 million and if this congregation is like us, listen, I'm not here to try to make you feel guilty of what somebody told you. I've had those, you know, Pastor, I feel so bad. Because listen, when God forgives you, you're forgiven. Don't live with a burden and guilt, but say, I know what's right. And somebody lied to me, and somebody told me it was nothing. And, and you know, to make ourselves even feel better, that's not counting now the pills that you can just take on the morning after or whatever that just says we can do away with this inconvenience because we want to live our life the way we want to live it. Let's get back to the Word of God that tells us how we should live and how we should be responsible and that life is not for our taking. Proverbs reminds us there are seven things that God hates. He hates the lie, but one of the things that he hates is the shedding of innocent blood. And let me say this, there's coming a payday. And the payday is not just to abortion doctors and abortion providers, but it's to others. When we begin to think about that, we think about what is our responsibility when all of this has taken place since 1973. Now, Best I can figure, I was a 15-year-old back at that particular day and time. I didn't have anything to do with it. But here's where the rubber hits the road. When we vote to put people in office who put laws like that into place and who put Supreme Court justices in the place who will not stand for life, then we bear some responsibility. I wasn't voting then. But let's, guess what? We are voting today. And we know what we should do and why we should do it. And you'll not find a perfect candidate out there from the start to finish. Because they're just as flawed as a sinful human being as you are. Some are saved and some are unsaved. But our job is to vote for a candidate who will stand closest to the biblical values that we hold true. It's the ancient landmark. That's our God-given responsibility. And when we shirk that and say, well, I've always been this or I've always been that, you better know what you're doing because you're not doing this in ignorance and there's enough information out there for us to know. But when we just begin to take life and say it doesn't matter, but God says, I hate that type of, of shedding of innocent blood. How many sources, how many of these people since 1973 could have already come up with the answer to cancer? Could have done this and could have done that. And who's the next person? You say, well, there's one thing about politicians. I don't trust any of them. You may have killed all of them before they ever had a chance. You see, God's going to hold us responsible. Sanctity of life. Sanctity of marriage. That God says from the beginning, it's Adam and Eve. It's it's one man, one woman. Jesus repeated that in the New Testament. These are his words. We know why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. We know why the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that God gave them up to their vile affections. He gave them up to a reprobate mind. He just gave them up. He said, I can't deal with that because they are going against my law and how I've stated things that are necessary for a society and a government and for the propagation of families that I have placed into order. But listen, what one 
generation tolerates, the next just simply accepts. Why? It's the law. This is the law, and that's the law. Abortion or, or same-sex marriage or whatever. You began to name it. It might be man's law, but it never usurps God's law. That's the ancient landmark. And we have to stand accountable and at times say, no, we're going we're gonna to fight against some of these kinds of things and say, this is right, this is wrong, God's word is true and let everyone else be a liar because God is always true in what he says. Uh, the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of morals, just a moral climate. Have you ever seen such a day, uh, I think it was 2020 the other night, I just got on the tail end of it, about road rage. Trying to think, some of y'all looked familiar. No, you didn't. <laughs> but you, people just go up and just shoot somebody because they're not driving or doing what they, you know, or somebody just walk up and shoot this father in a tent and he's got two precious children in the tent. Have you ever seen such? Somebody just walks into this school or this newspaper or this sporting event and tries to shoot someone. And then you say, well, you know, the problems with guns, no, the problems with the heart. The problems with the heart, it's very interesting that we don't have a problem with saying, well, it, it, it's, it's this and it's the guns and that kind of thing. And, 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 and maybe there's some type of tighter control you can make on that. But the thing that I've always seen is when somebody wants one, they're going to have one and you'll never be able to take it out of some of their hands because of what they have. But the truth of the matter is the heart's the problem. It always has been the problem. And so years ago, some of you here remember the cigarette commercials. Anybody remember the cigarette commercials? Oh, come on, y'all older than I am. <laughs> now, young people are sitting down here saying, what, they had cigarette commercials? Yes. How about Territon? I'd rather fight than switch, and they had a black eye. Listen, some of you could sing the jingles. You know you could. Because you remember what it was like. I'm not going there. I'm not going to sing them. But anyway... You know what I'm talking about. Let's outlaw it because it causes cancer. Nobody's making somebody smoke. But why in the world do you have all the beer commercials and the wine commercials and the whiskey commercials when people are killed by drunk drivers every day and ruining lives everywhere and all the hundreds of thousands of people who are maimed and families that are broken up and they can do things saying, well, I wasn't in my right mind. I was just drunk. But let's continue to propagate that. We're talking about the sanctity of morals in life. And when our morals go down, then, well, I'm not responsible. I was not in my right mind. I was not thinking you were not in your right mind because your mind and your heart needs to be given over to the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we remove the ancient landmark, then everything goes awry. That's, that's what I'm saying. And it never could be a bigger stake than it is right now. When you start talking about candidates and you talk about Supreme Court picks and that kind of thing, which is actually the reason that some of us maybe voted in a certain way that we did because there may be an opportunity now to actually undo Roe versus Wade and save lives. That's what it's about. It's not a political issue. It's a biblical issue. We cannot say something is right and take innocent blood and say, well, it's the law. God's law doesn't usurp or man's law doesn't usurp God's law that's why today we stand un, as one nation under God it's in God that we trust he's first and he's the one that we answer to and by the way as patriotic as we are and we've done a great job today we're not going to get to heaven one day and give an account of how good a patriot we were that's just the facts you must be born again. That's the bottom line. Supreme Court decisions don't matter. Well, it was in 1947 that the Supreme Court first used the term separation of church and state, taken out of a letter. It was in 1962, I was four years old, that the Supreme Court ruled that students could no longer voluntarily offer a 22-word prayer. In 1963, the Supreme Court ruled that we no longer have a voluntary reading of 10 verses of Scripture. Some of us can remember, I remember in those very early years, I guess it must have been in my first grade class that there was a devotion that was given because then it would have been done away. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruled that teachers cannot recite a poem that is versed like a prayer. 
In 1980, the court ruled that the Ten Commandments could no longer be posted in schools as they were in Kentucky because that may be offensive to someone. As William Bennett, who was the Secretary of Education appointed by Ronald Reagan, who did a study on this called the Index of Leading Cultural Indicators. And in that study from 1960 to 1990, based upon a lot of these Supreme Court rulings, he said this, it was during that 30-year period, just the 30-year period, 60 to 1990, put you where we are, there was a 419% increase in illegitimate births. The divorce rate quadrupled. 200% increase in teenage suicide, a 560% increase in violent crime, 10 million teens with a drinking problem, many of which are binge drinkers, and there was also an 80-point drop in SAT scores. There's a price to pay. When we move away from God and the ancient landmarks and when we move toward doing our own thing in life, And God says there will be a price to pay. Some of you may listen. He's gone now on to heaven. But back when he was preaching, he said this. This is Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Some of you listen to him as he talks. And he does it on the radio and you hear him talk. He says this. America is coasting downhill on a godly ancestry, blaming today's generation because the landmarks were removed in his generation. Wow. It puts the blame back. Sat on our hands, didn't do anything, just thought everybody could kind of work this thing out and just trusted they could. No, we have to be salt and light. And if the ancient landmarks are removed, we're going to have trouble. So we've got to confess to the removal of spiritual landmarks that we have. But also there's the, there's the fact that what we need to do now is just commit to the restoration of spiritual landmarks. What do we do? Well, 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is still correct. That if my people, that is God's people, who are called by my name and we're called by his name and by the Christian name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from my wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. But it's because we decided to do something. And that doing something is not simply complaining. It's doing what we can do. It's not simply complaining. It's not simply praying. It's doing what we can do in everything that we can do. The first word is to repent. That old word that nobody likes. We, we, can, we, we like to turn over a new leaf. Well, I like to try to do better But it's a word that I don't like, and especially in the church today. And if we're waiting on Washington, our educational leaders, entertainment professionals, or sports people to fix this, you can forget it. It starts with the people of God. We need to repent. And be like those ancient prophets who repented even though they were not guilty of those sins. As a whole, they were a part of it, and they said, we have sinned. We who are believers must humble ourselves and pray. And fall on our face before God. It's it's humbling. It's praying. Seeking God's mercy. It's seeking his face. Oh God we have strayed from you. God we have not done what you expect us to do. Our light has not shined. We've been so afraid. In here we can say amen. Hallelujah. But we go outside the doors. It's like let me put on my camouflage again. Because I just. I don't want anybody to think that I'm. Maybe judgmental. Jesus said a few things that seemed to be judgmental. At times, he didn't even seem to say it with love. But you had to read through there. There's right and there's wrong. And we have to stand for what is right. And that's what God expects. Seek his face in repentance. You see, that was the message as John the Apostle wrote to the churches, the seven churches, to the church of Ephesus who had lost their first love. He says, remember from where you have fallen, repent. And do, the good, and do the first works. The church at Sardis were told, or remember therefore how you've received and heard, hold fast and repent. Church at Pergamos was a compromising church on their doctrine. And he says, repent or else I'll come quickly and remove the candlestick. Church at Thyatira was a corrupt church that was called to repent. You see, we've got to repent. The problem's with that word. 
man, it just sounds so harsh. It, it sounds so rough. It sounds so judgmental. It sounds so biblical. That's the first word Jesus said when he came in Matthew 4, 17. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If Jesus is the first one to call it to us in his ministry, then I think it's still a word we can use today. By the way, you'll never be saved until you repent of your sin. You're not trusting Jesus to become one of the good old boys, to come, become one of the followers of Christ. Well, I just kind of like Jesus. He's a pretty cool guy, and I, I just want to kind of trip after him a little bit. No, no, no. Well, he's got a lot of good things. He says, says treat people in this particular. I just kind of like that. So, no, 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 no. He didn't come for you to follow him like that. He came because you and I needed a Savior and somebody had to die for our sins because our biggest sin wasn't that we're following the wrong person. Our biggest problem is we're sinners and we needed a Savior. And he died on the cross for our sins. You see, when Jesus says repent, we've got to repent of our sins. That's why he died, my sins. You ever think about all the sins you've committed just up to this point? Don't add today's into it. Just up to this point, your sins he died for. Well, he, nobody could possibly, nobody could, but the Son of God could because he is God. And he saw them all. And so we have to repent of our sins, saying, Jesus, it was you who came to die for my sins. I had no other way. I had nobody else. And you died for my sins. That's why we trust him. But we have to repent of our sins and trust him as our Savior because we need a Savior. Repent. We've also got to return. Return to the good works, he said over and over again. The picture today. Why is it today that so many are wandering, doing their own thing? Why is it that so many have walked away from God and walked away from the church? Well, it's because America's been going down that road. Maybe because they're kind of seeking their own way of going. The prayer of even most Christians is, Lord, now you know I'm going to do this today, and I've decided I'm going to do that, and I'm going to go in this direction, and I just want to ask you to bless it. Who's leading and who's following? We're asking him to bless us, to follow after us, so he can just bless everything that we do. Just bless everything. We, no, no. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And you lead me in that particular way. We've got to remove certain things. You know, I've been reading through the Bible this year in a way that has taken me through Kings and Chronicles. You're talking about some, <laughs> some dusty... I mean, some of that's just kind of dry. That this one had this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. Here's, you know, but here's one of the recurring things. And this king did many wonderful things, but he did not remove the high places, the idols in their lives. He didn't make them remove the idols in their lives. What is an idol? Well, I don't have any idols sitting around. An idol is what you deem to be more, more valuable than Jesus. What takes more of your time? Those become our idols. They're in things, plans that we have, that we want in this life. Those are become our idols. And it says this, and they did not serve me with their whole heart. And, and then you, here's the next king, and, and like his father, he did not serve with a whole heart. And then his son, and he did not serve with a whole heart. Oh, God, give us a generation that will rise up and restore the borders and say, give us back the ancient landmarks. Whatever anybody else does, we're going to serve the Lord because that's what God wants us to do. So he says, return and remove certain things out of your life. You know, that's tough to do. You might be a, you might be a hoarder. You say, well, I'm not really a hoarder, but you got so much in your life, there's no room for Jesus I've been to some places like that to visit. You couldn't find a seat. You could walk in. You can't find a seat. Somebody said, don't come to my house. Listen, it's not about finding a place to sit. It's like you don't have any room for anything else. And that's how we can be spiritually. we got so much in our life, there's no room for Jesus. Remove those things that don't need to be there. And then he says, replace we're to put off the old, put on the new. That's what the new believer is all about, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's a new day. It's a new world. America, restore the ancient landmarks. So let me ask you here today. Where are you in this whole process? 
Uh, I'm just kind of came for the patriotic service. No. I'm just here today. What you hollering at me for? I'm, not, I'm hollering at all of us. I'm not even trying to holler at us. I'm just being emphatic. Because we've sat by. And listen, yes, you've sat by. Some of you who've sat by and you've allowed these things to happen over the years so that our generation today embraces that. And some things that have happened that we've not stood strong enough for that we'll have to bear account of. And then we will say, I don't understand why my children are in church, my grandchildren aren't in church, and I don't understand why this next generation don't do this and that. And I don't understand some of it either, and some of it, you've done everything that you possibly can do. But this world pulls at them so hard. Listen, I can't make that decision for you, but you can make it, and you can restore the ancient landmark that you've moved away as if it were not important. And you can reestablish the foundations and say, this is important. Let me just share a word with you here. That, that's, you know one of the frustrating things to me? We're living in a generation where even families, maybe their children have come along, and even though this person has lived a godly life, even their children see no need of even having a Christian memorial service. As a pastor, I'm saying, what are you talking about? Man, this, is, this was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is somebody that needs to be applauded for their life. They worked and they lived for Christ. And there's not even memorial service. It's like, it's over, it's done. It's that, where they're going to heaven, it's not, listen, why was it so important that they lived the life they lived? And who did they live for? And by the way, here's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, how you can come to know him too. You see, it's a whole different day we live in. It's time to restore the ancient landmarks and say, get back to the Bible, get back to our soul authority, get back to walking like we should. And then we won't be saying every night when we watch the news, what's this world coming to? What's America coming to? It's coming to what we've allowed it to come to. And so it's time to restore the ancient landmarks. The invitation's simple. And that is, if you don't have the most crucial landmark in your life, and that is the born-again experience, you must be born again. If you're trusting in your heritage, you're not there. And listen, even if you're a military person, people don't go to heaven just because they serve in the military and even give their life. Jesus, when he said, greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, he wasn't really even talking about the military people. We use that. He was talking about himself. He was going to give his own life. But if that person or you or anybody else have never been born again, they've missed it all. And I don't want you to miss it all. I want you to have a spiritual landmark because that's the only thing that's going to matter. That's why Jesus came. Because you had to have him and I had to have him. And I needed a Savior. If you've never repented of your sins, this is the day. This is the day. And in a moment, I'm going to lead us through a prayer. And it may be a prayer that you just join along with. But it's a time for believers to say, Oh, I don't care what anybody else does on my row. I don't care what. I'm going to be a person who begins to take the time I have left and use it for the glory of God and Help where I can help to reestablish the ancient landmarks that have been removed, the things in this nation that need to be restored. I'm going to do what I need to do for my king because I'm an ambassador of the king. Would you bow your heads? And in the stillness of this moment, we're going to pray. Maybe some of you even today to say, if I died tonight, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that spiritual landmark's ever taken place in my life. And today, I'm just going to ask you to say, if I've got doubts about that, I'm just going to ask you to do one thing. No one's looking around. Would you simply just raise your hand and say, pray for me. I am really not sure. I'm struggling with this in my life. I'm just not sure. Oh, God, that this day, I pray that no person would leave without a sure knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this day, the main spiritual landmark would be restored, that Jesus would be Savior and Lord. Lord, I pray you'd help them pray a prayer much like this. Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner. 
And I do believe you came to die for me on the cross in my sins. I believe you rose from the dead the third day. And I'm asking you to forgive me, to be my Savior and Lord. Give me the strength to live for you. Oh, Father, you've heard that prayer today from that heart who really meant it. Would you give them the strength to just confess that now? The first act of confession would be to come to tell me, to tell Tony, Darren, someone that they pray to receive Christ today, and we'll rejoice along with them. I'm praying for believers today who just haven't been a part of restoring the ancient landmarks. Just kind of let everything go. And like an old home, it'll just go into ruin if it's not kept up. Oh, God, we've treated this nation like this. And then we wonder why there are shootings and killings and things that we never imagined would ever take place in this nation. We've just let it go to pieces. Oh, Father, this day, may we pray like Joshua. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Set the landmark today, God. This day is a new day. Father, help us to draw to you. And you said if we'll draw close to you, you'll draw close to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar's open. Would you come? Right now, this first stanza as we stand, as we sing. You know, as we think about the problems with America today, it's as if the, the church is on a raging river, and we're in a boat, and we're just being carried along by the rapids. Rather than trying to help determine which way the rapids are flowing, we've decided just to jump on with everybody else. You know, God calls us to be light. He calls us to be salt. He calls us to make a difference. And we've allowed the, those ancient landmarks to be removed, those historical and spiritual borders that our, our nation has had through the years, and they continue to be eroded away. And simply by doing nothing, our nation is in the fix that it's in today. So many problems, and we've moved further and further away from God. Perhaps today would be a great day for us just to say, hey, let's get back to the basics. Let's get back to our founding before Almighty God. Let's get back to those spiritual landmarks that were laid down and this nation was founded upon, and let's begin to make a difference. Not relying upon Washington, not relying upon others, but saying, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, and we're going to be the citizens that we ought to be in this country, and we're going to lay down some landmarks for those who will come behind us. You know, you can't have that spiritual landmark in your life until you have the greatest, the most important landmark, and that's knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Do you know him as your Savior and Lord? And if not, why not right now? There's no better time, no better week to do that than right now. So I'm going to ask that you would pray with me at this time and uh, just ask the Lord to, to come into your heart to be your Savior and Lord. And then we're going to allow Christians to pray that we might become the influence that we need to be. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're thankful so much for the day. We're grateful for the opportunity as we think about our July 4th birthday and how, what that means to us. We're grateful that we live in a nation that has been founded upon Christian principles. Uh, there's no discussion about that. We know where it's been founded. And Lord, because of that, we need to be the Christians you've called us to be. We need to, to be a part of the answer and not a pro part of the problem. We don't need just to roll along with the times, but we need to set the times. And Lord, that starts with the spiritual moorings in our own life, those landmarks that we're to have. And Lord, that is to make sure that we have been born again. And I'm praying for those right now that are watching the broadcast that would say, you know, I've always known about God. I've always known about Jesus, but I, I don't know. I know him personally. So Father, right now, I just ask that they would have the opportunity to ask you to come into their life, to be their Savior, to be their Lord, and to lead them in this life. Father, would you help them to pray a prayer much like this? Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner, and I do believe that Jesus came and he died on the cross for my sins and the sins of the world. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior, and help me to follow you. And Lord, I'm grateful for every decision that's been made today. 
And I pray for those today that, that uh, would come along and say, you know, I've done that a number of years ago. And, and Lord, I pray that we would all band together today to say we're going to be a part of the pace setters. We're going to be part of those who will lay down those landmarks upon which this nation was founded and more so to be the believers that you've called us to be in that landmark called the Bible, your word. I pray, Lord, that we will be those who are willing to stand, not to go along with the times, but in the midst of these times to be about changing the culture in which we live because everybody needs to know Jesus and worship him. So, Father, would you allow us to do that? Help us to make this commitment on this week of all times, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our prayer is that you'll have a good and a godly week as we have this wonderful time of our national birthday. God bless. If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashevillebaptist.org, to give online, or by calling the church office at 828-253-9824.